Welcome back to another episode of the Six Piece Podcast as we continue our look into Alfred Hitchcock's rear window. And today we're going to focus on the key theme of voyeurism. Voyeurism is, of course, to define it, it's when you observe or watch others without their consent or without their them knowing. And when it comes to rear window, whenever I get asked, what is rear window about? The first thing I normally go to is this idea about voyeurism that is quite complex, really, when you break it down as it's showcased throughout the film. But in a nutshell, it really is about watching and observing other people. It does have these sexual undertones to it as well, but it was definitely something that was around uh, American society during the 1950s and something that we can still consider today in today's contemporary society as well. Um, and whether it's that physical action of watching other people or uh, checking on people through things like social media, uh, it's definitely still relevant and prevalent today. In terms of other vocabulary, you can look at verbs like spying, observing, leering and peeping, which again have these negative connotations, but verbs like watching, viewing, surveying, nouns like surveillance. You can even look at um, scopophilia, which again has sexual connotations, but this is all vocab that, that you can use um, as well as voyeurism in order to sort of um, really explore this particular theme um, without repeating yourself all the time. A really important thing to remember though is that voyeurism or being voyeuristic they are obviously nouns and adjectives. There aren't in any verbs. You can't voyeur or you can't be voyeuring. So this is something that's come up a little bit in essays and even on exams, I've seen it before as well. So just be really mindful of this um, when it comes to your writing. You can't voyeur or you can't be voyeuring, um, but you can definitely be um, a voyeur or you can be voyeuristic um, or you can partake in voyeurism. So again, just be really mindful that voyeur and ver voyeuring are not verbs. So let's have a look at the context because as we know, this film was made in 1954 and during the 1950s in America, during the Cold War, there was this systemic and widespread fear of communism that was spearheaded by Senator Joseph McCarthy and the American government really were encouraging citizens to spy on their neighbours and to report any suspicious behaviour. We know that individuals um, were arrested, questioned, sent into jail for being suspected communists or alleged communist sympathizers with little to no concrete evidence on this. It was mere hearsay and rumor. And it's really interesting because this film dissects the moral motivations and consequences of voyeurism. At times, it's really clear that Hitchcock is condemning this behavior, saying it's immoral and unethical, um, but at other times, he's promoting it. And the characters are conflicted with this idea about whether their behavior is good or bad. And I definitely encourage students to be able to argue either way with this and make sure you've got that concrete evidence and those film techniques and those symbols and that context information to ensure that you can argue that way. Again, when it comes to voyeurism, I feel that context is really, really important. So too with gender roles, of course, as well and gender expectations. But again, you can use context information as evidence in your text or as additional information to support your ideas and to support your evidence. Let's have a look at some key ideas. And again, I'm only giving you merely a snapshot of voyeurism. I definitely encourage you to go out, undertake your own research, work out your own ideas and build your own evidence to support those ideas. I've got four here that I'm going to look at today. The first one is the idea that voyeurism is unethical. The second one, that voyeurism is socially accepted or encouraged. The third one, that the audience are complicit in L.B. Jeffrey's actions. And the last one, that voyeurism allows for individuals to live vicariously, as shown through the protagonist. There are, of course, many others that you could look at. One potentially could be um, that voyeurism is dangerous or comes with dangerous consequences, that acting unethically um, leads to punishment, that individuals should be punished for acting un un unethically. But there are so many more that you could look at. This is merely a snapshot, but we're going to go through these one at a time. When it comes to finding evidence for the film, there's a couple of things you should be, I guess, collating. These are quotations, film techniques, symbols and motifs. And of course, what we spoke about a little bit before, that social, historical and cultural context information and detail that just showcase to 
the examiner or the marker in the case of your SAC where having a knowledge of the world of the text is really important. But you do want to get it into the examiner's mind that you understand wholeheartedly this is an American film set in the 1950s during the height of the Cold War and McCarthyism. So when it comes to this idea of voyeurism being unethical, there's a couple of key scenes I think you should look at. And, you know, it's no coincidence that Jeff is involved in all of them. The first scene is Jeff and Stella. That's in the opening section of the film. Another one could be Jeff and Doyle discussing this. And the last one happens just before, well, while Lisa closes the blinds and just before she does that between Jeff and Lisa when they question whether their behavior is in fact ethical. Let's have a look at some evidence now to support this idea that voyeurism is unethical. And the first quotation comes from Stella in that scene when she says, we've become a race of peeping toms. What people ought to do is get outside their own house and look in for a change. Stella here is calling for introspection, for individuals to reflect on their own lives rather than looking at the lives of others. And note that first part of the quotation, we've become a race of peeping Tom. She's talking about American society here, the fact that everyone is looking at other people. And that phrase peeping Toms um, has legal repercussions. It's, it's illegal to be a peeping Tom. It has these really negative sexual leering connotations to it. Um, and again, it's, it, it's a felony. You can get arrested for it. The second quotation comes from Jeffries when he's pondering whether watching Lars Thorvald day and night even if he does, has committed a crime, is that still ethical? He says, do you suppose it's ethical? And that scene is a really good one to have a look at. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting to note that they really consider their, their behavior and close their blinds right before the couple with the dog or the woman with the dog screams out after seeing that her dog has been murdered. And that ultimately is what convinces them that in fact he has committed the murder. And that actually exacerbates their behavior then. Um, it really intensifies and, and Lisa ends up going into the void, into the world that Jeffries has built. The last quotation comes from Lisa. She calls their behavior diseased. Um, and it's ironic, I guess, that Lisa ends up being the one who gets arrested in the end um, for being, well, for, for snooping around um, and for taking Lars Thorwald's ring. When it comes to symbols, I really like this shot on the right-hand side, this close-up of Jeff where we see the binoculars sort of replacing his eyes. You really could look at this in a number of ways, but I think for me it's really important to look at, at the fact that this has overtaken Jeff's world. And it goes to my next point as well, this Kuleshov effect, which Hitchcock uses to show Jeffrey's initially considering whether his behavior is right or wrong. For a moment there, we look at his behavior and he definitely does feel uncomfortable about what he is doing. Nonetheless, he continues to spy on his neighbors. So I definitely think that the Kuleshov effect is, is something that I would use to look at this idea of voyeurism being unethical. Again, there are so many other ways, so many other quotations you could use to go about this. This is just a bit of a snapshot about how you might go about it. So let's have a brief look at the next idea, which is the notion that voyeurism is socially acceptable. And the first scene I would be having a look at is the helicopter scene. Yes, it is a fake helicopter, but I think we can cut Hitchcock a little bit of slack because special effects were not what they are today back in 1954. The reason why I find it interesting is, firstly, it suggests that this sort of behavior is happening throughout all of American society. It's not simply confined to Jeffrey's apartment and, and Jeffrey's himself as an individual. Note that the helicopter is looking or hovering over women who are sunbaking um, without any clothes on. Again, it hints to this sort of sexual side, um, lascivious behavior um, when it comes to voyeurism and the male gaze as well. And something well worth looking at when it comes to this notion. I'd also be looking at the scene, as I mentioned previously, that involves Stella and Jeffries, where she says, we've become a race of peeping Toms. She lambasts, she slams Jeffries for his behavior and has a go at him, yet she quickly becomes involved in his theory. She ends up watching, um, along with Jeffries, watching Thorwald's apartment. She tries to find the name 
um, on the mail truck. She climbs over the fence and starts digging in his garden. Um, and so too, I guess, does Lisa as well, which all goes to show this idea that it's okay to do it. If individuals like you know, Stella and Lisa are doing it, then surely it must be okay. The other thing to also consider is the contextual information and the fact that the American government at the time were definitely promoting and definitely encouraging citizens to spy on their neighbours and to name names or to provide information about... Um, The next idea I want to have a look at is the idea that the audience is complicit in Jeffrey's voyeuristic behavior. And it's summed up by this quotation from Lars Thorwald when he enters Jeffrey's apartment and he asks him, what do you want from me? Note that Jeffrey's is silent and doesn't really respond to this. And for me, it suggests that Jeffrey's doesn't really know what he's doing, nor do we as the audience. With this idea, though, I think it's so important to look at film techniques and show how Hitchcock, through his use of these film techniques or directorial devices or directorial decisions, however you want to sort of word it, um, it's his work that makes the audience complicit. And I've picked a couple of um, techniques here. The first one is a breaking of the fourth wall, which we see in the shot to the right hand side. So... When Thorwald notices that Lisa is showing the ring to Jeffries, Thorwald looks up and directly at Jeffries. But at the same time, he's also looking at the audience. And we're sort of overcome with this guilt as if, oh, we've been caught. And we sort of have to question our own behavior. And this is what Hitchcock wants to prompt within that 1954 American audience. Is what they're doing the right thing? Hitchcock also uses vignetting. So whenever Jeffries is looking through his binoculars or look through his camera lens, the outside of the frame or the outside of the shot is blacked out. So we are sharing what Jeffries is seeing. And I'll skip over lighting because I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But this idea about perspective is really important because just like Jeffries is confined to his wheelchair, just like Jeffries is restricted to his plaster cocoon, we too are confined to his perspective throughout this film. Whatever Jeffrey sees, we see. Pretty much every scene is shot from Jeffrey's apartment and every scene involves Jeffrey's. There are a couple of, um, I guess, outliers here. The first scene is after, on the night that Jeffrey hears the screams from Thorwald's apartment, which we later learn is when he kills his wife. We see Thorwald leaving the um, apartment with a woman. The next scene, um, though, does involve um, Jeffries, but we see it from outside the apartment. It's after the dog or the owner of the dog finds her dog lying dead on the pavement on the ground, and we get a couple of shots um, that aren't restricted to Jeffries apartment. Particularly, we see a nice close-up of Miss Torso showing her compassion and sympathy for what has happened, and of course. The last scene is where we see Jeffries finally being thrust out into the world um, and sort of being punished for his behavior when he's dangling um, outside his rear window. So there's only a couple of scenes that aren't shot from Jeffries' apartment. That's so important because we see what he sees, we share his perspective, and therefore we share his views. These are just four techniques that are used, but there are so many more that you could explore and dissect and analyze to showcase this particular idea. The last one I want to look at is this idea of living vicariously. And I want to bring in two other themes to explore this and to show that themes do overlap throughout the film. So while we're predominantly talking about voyeurism in this, in this um, video, there's no um, reason why you can't bring in these other themes. And the first one that I'd like to have a look at is marriage. Just quickly, living vicariously means that you live through others. And for me, Jeffrey's views on marriage are shaped by what he sees around him. And I'm going to focus on the Thorwalds here. And there's a bit of cross-cutting that's done here by Hitchcock to show this. But as Jeffrey's is on the phone to his editor, Gunnison, who's pushing and prodding him about marriage, he just says, can't you just see me rushing home to a hot apartment to listen to the automatic laundry and the electric dishwasher and the garbage disposal and the nagging wife. And as he's saying this, 
He's watching a nagging wife. He's watching Anna Thorwald nag Lars Thorwald. It's also interesting as well because the way he views the newlyweds as well is quite interesting. He sees them having a really traditional relationship and then he notices the husband eventually sort of leaning out the window, gasping for air at the end. So his views on marriage are really based on what he sees. Even when Stella comes into the apartment the first time and sort of says what she has, she views marriage, he doesn't want a bar of it. He's made up his mind. He's quite stubborn in, in his views. And the ending is a little bit, well, it's quite interesting. You could sort of go either way with it, whether um, Jeffries is happy to be settled down or not. The next theme to look at would be gender roles and the way that he views the two women, namely Miss Torso and Miss Lonely Hearts. Firstly, take note of the fact that he describes these women based on either their physical appearance or their marital status or romantic status. He sees Miss Torso as being the queen bee with her pick of the drones. Ultimately, it's proven wrong. Well, firstly, because she um, shuts a door on a man towards the start of the film, but here we see her or her partner, Stanley, returning home. Um, we can assume that that is her, her boyfriend, and she's so happy to, to, to see him. And then we've got Miss Lonely Hearts. He views an older unmarried woman, woman as being lonely and sort of having a strong desire to find someone when he says, poor Miss Lonely Hearts drank herself to sleep last night. He then makes the comparisons, of course, to Lisa. So we can see how he views Lisa based on his neighbours. He's living vicariously. This, of course, is quite, quite a dangerous way to live. And to an extent, um, we can see how Jeffries does sort of change his mindset, or we can assume he changes his mindset towards the end based on what really has happened. Just with any of these, these ideas, don't forget your next level analysis. We're not just thinking about quotations. We're also thinking about film techniques, symbols, motifs, and context information as well. So let's have a look at a sample paragraph that focuses on this theme of voyeurism, um, but speaks about the idea of introspection. And the topic sentence reads, Jeff's predilection for voyeurism ultimately provides him with a closed perspective on the outside world, leaving him helpless. In a period of confinement, Jeff does not take the opportunity to reflect on his own actions, but instead looks out and projects his own fears onto his neighbours. Jeff does not merely observe others to escape his swamp of boredom, but to validate his views. Hitchcock emphasises this through editing, with Jeff Jeff outlining his reservations on marriage, cross-cut with close-ups of his facial expression upon viewing Thorwald encountering his rat nagging wife. These hostilities are further expressed as he conveys to Lisa that the songwriter probably had a very unhappy marriage, despite having no such evidence. It is this biased perspective that causes Jeff to ignore the nuclear family above, as they do not contain the concatenation of marriage and violence present in the Thorwalds that he craves. Jeff, Jeff's behaviour becomes increasingly dubious, highlighted by a close-up of Jeff spying through his camera, covering his entire face. The audience can no longer see his eyes, but a reflection of the apartment says he's blinded from the truth. The camera symbolises that Jeff's interest in other people's lives has removed any need for introspection, with his thoughts instead projected on the lives of those around him. Stella's apprehension at Jeff's antics, with a portable keyhole, is a reflection of Hitchcock's core concern that viewers need to look in for a change of their own lives rather than those around them, condemning the widespread suspicion pervading American society in the 1950s. Jeff's voyeurism causes him to be ignorant towards himself and his own problems that ultimately places him in a disadvantageous position, unable to progress past these issues. Thus, Jeff's position in his apartment and ghoulishness leaves him helpless whilst holding a closed perspective on the outside world. This is a solid paragraph here there's some nice quotations in here there's some nice film techniques as well could do with a little bit more analysis i feel at times but the vocabulary is pretty good i just think that analysis needs to be a little bit more detailed as well but you can see that they're exploring this idea of introspection throughout and they're being really consistent in terms of their idea Right, now it's over to you. Firstly, consider other ideas in relation to voyeurism. Find quotations and film techniques to help support these ideas. 
Another thing you might like to do is look at some of the ideas we touched upon earlier and find your own quotations or film techniques on these or find your own unique interpretations because that's a great way to really improve. And the last thing I suggest that you do is to write practice paragraphs on these ideas and seek feedback from your teacher because they are your number one resource. But thanks so much for your company today. We'll see you next time on the 6Ps podcast.